So we're here to talk about pricing artwork. So we're talking really specifically about pricing your artwork as like, I have a piece, I'm selling it to a specific buyer. So it's not going to cover as much of like, oh, I'm a designer, I'm trying to work with clients, anything like that. This is very specifically like, I have a piece, I'm selling it to a one-off buyer. We will have other talks specifically around design work um, later on in this school year. This is being hosted in conjunction with the student union. So the student union with its new opening is going to be starting to curate some shows, get student work up, really using that space to highlight the work of the people at Pratt. So definitely start to look around for those specific, those calls for open things because that's going to be a great way to put your artwork up there and they're really interested in students being able to sell their work through that process as well. They're not going to use like charge any overhead if you sell work through their specific thing. Um, they really just want to highlight student work as much as possible. So we're going to go ahead and get started. As you can see my GIF didn't super work out with all of the technology stuff so we're just going to go. So we really, I want to begin with just not, well, in everything I've looked at, it's the assumption, but really to start out with this truth that your work has value. The work that you create is valued. There is someone out there that is going to want to buy the work that you make for, and the highlighted area here, a reasonable price, which begs the question, what do we mean by reasonable? So before I get super into what I mean by reasonable, I'm going to talk about something that's not it's art adjacent, I would say, um, but I picked an item that I've spent some money on and that I talk about on a semi-regular basis, so I would be able to go in and really talk about what do I mean by a reasonable price and how can you evaluate prices against other things. So we're going to talk about dice. So the dice that I have pictured right here, this is pretty much the standard regular plastic if you were going to play Dungeons and Dragons like group of dice that you would end up buying. They're not super balanced. They're made by a company called Chessex. They're pretty much the standard dice that you're going to pick up at any store that you go to. So this dice, pair of dice is specifically $7.60 on Amazon. So then there's metal dice. So if you really think about the material of the dice, this metal dice is, and I can't actually see that on here. Ooh, that is, there we go. Um, okay, that's going to keep doing that. The metal dice you can see is more than twice the cost of the plastic dice. Oh, is that not? Okay. There we go. There we go. That was probably what my issue was. Um, so the plastic dice, and that's just going to keep doing that apparently, um, are 760. If you look at the metal dice, they're 20 bucks. Um, which, if you really think about it, they're probably not super balanced, but it's three times the price because the material is a better material. It's made out of metal. So then. The next set of dice is another set of plastic dice. This is from a company called Kraken who makes really specific, like what I would say like artisanal dice. They really design their dice. They go in, they're always creating new products with new designs. There's limited amounts that they make of each run. So this is two times the price of that initial plastic dice because it's a more specialized way of creating it. It's They're more one-offs, they're not being made for general everywhere, everyone to buy everywhere all the time. Um, I haven't actually seen them retail anywhere. They mainly sell through their website. They're also possibly made from a slightly better material, a different type of resin than what the other dice are made of. So then this is a pair of metal dice by Kraken. You can see that while they are more expensive still than the plastic dice, they don't have the same markup between the metals as there is between the plastic because the cost of the material is still pretty similar between there, but it is still a little bit more expensive because it is a different making of the die. There are once more limited runs. There's a little bit more that goes into it. As you can see design-wise, this is a like rainbow dice. There's a little bit more that has to happen in creating that. So just to start to hammer this home a little bit, if you're really thinking about material, if we go up to something like a precious stone-based dice, you get a really big price jump there. This is almost $100 for both of these sets of dice. These are two different companies. The one that's the black background, that's the Kraken dice. So same company, big jump up because of the materials once more. Same idea of how they're going about designing them, but it's a much more precious stone versus the one with the white background. That's from a company called Level Up Dice. So they kind of 
really work toward this high end dice. That's what this company puts in. It's still a similar price point though, because no matter what they're putting in, they're really going based off the cost of the precious stone that they're using. These are just some other materials from Level Up Dice that they use. You can see kind of, sorry, it's a little bit blurry the different price points here. So the amethyst are about 95, the brass is 145. And then this, okay, this is really annoying. Um, this domesticated yak bone is $300 for that set of dice that's there. So it's kind of a big jumping around point that happens um, with the dice. So then to add that materials thing, Level Up calls something sell something called caged dice. So Level Up specifically, one of their big selling points is that they really measure their dice for accuracy, for balance. So it's a really specialized way of going about it versus some of the other ones I say, don't really talk about if they do that. They just make the dice. If it's unbalanced, it's unbalanced. Um, so the caged dice are a specific technique that they have where they go in and basically cut out the dice um, with a laser. So this one, while it's the same material as the brass one, is retails for 357 versus the $145 of the initial one. So despite it being made of the same material, that extra process, that extra step, means that it costs a little bit more. Okay, so what does this have to do with artwork? So this idea of reasonable. So your prices need to make sense. Part of what I wanted to show you, one, was how I was measuring it up against other people selling similar products. That you can see that as much as there's going to be a difference between stuff, it's still going to end up being, you need to be within the same range. If people are used to pay, paying $8 for plastic dice, they're not going to pay $20 for plastic dice. That's a big jump off to be, unless you can give them a good reason why you, they need to pay $20 for that dice. They need to be fair. They need to be justified. So how does this work for you as far as pricing your artwork does? So where, yeah, so where your work fits is the first part you want to do that. That's kind of where this research ends up going because you can't price your artwork inside the void. Um, so one, you need to define your market. Where are you going to be selling? Are you selling in New York? Are you selling in your hometown? Are you selling in the region that you're in? Are, so are you selling in the East Coast? Are you selling to the U.S. total? or are you selling to the entire world? So defining that market is gonna be a good starting point because then you can do the research into cool. Well, if you're selling in New York City, we have a higher cost of living. People probably have a little bit more money. That's gonna be a little bit of a higher price point than if you're selling somewhere like Kansas where the cost of living is a lot lower, the amount of income is just gonna, is different where that measures. And then who are you selling to? Are, is it, People, older people that maybe have a little bit more extra income going on. Are you selling to college students? Are you tell, tell, eh, selling to um, people that are kind of mid-career? Really figuring out who are those sorts of people that you're selling to, but that can go beyond that. It can be, are you selling to people who are maybe um, into organic vegetables, who are cat people who have the money to have an animal, who have kids, who have anything like that, those sort of factors are going to be really important for knowing because that's going to help you sort of understand what their disposable income is going to look like to be able to decide, okay, are you pricing within the range that they can do? From there, you want to define the art itself that you're making. What are the physical characteristics of it and what are the ideas you're exploring? Um, Within that, some medium is going to be important to consider. So generally within the art world, paintings sell more than drawings, which sell more than prints. Um, that's just the trends that we have seen. That's kind of how it ends up working out. But you're going to use this to decide how is your work similar to others. Another painter might be the right person for you to compare yourself against, but it might not be. It might be another artist who's exploring similar themes of art. It also is going to be a mix between the two of them. So you want to not look at just like, well, what are other painters working at a similar size selling their things for? But what are drawers that are working on similar subject matters doing? What are painters that are working much smaller than me, but are maybe using similar like lit techniques that you're using? What are they selling their stuff for? Because you want to start to get a ballpark of what people are going to pay for these things. Um, then you need to figure out your career level. So if most of you are still current students, then you're still pretty much entry level new artists. So that's going to be a factor because your work's not going to sell the same as someone that's mid-career, senior level career. There's no name behind you at this point yet. And then after you kind of have gathered all of that, who fits your same Venn diagram? What are, who has a, a similar career level to you? Who has similar work to you? Who's selling to similar people that you want to sell to? 
and then you need to figure out what they're charging for it. So by doing that, one, going on their website, hopefully they have some prices on their website with their work if they're selling through that. See if they have representation. You can reach out to their representation. They shouldn't be necessarily, it shouldn't be hard to find what people are charging for work. It's something they want to have out there because as I'm going to say, you don't want your um, potential collectors to have to dig for it. And you know, if you have to suddenly dig for something, you might go, eh, never mind. I don't want to buy this anymore if it takes that long to find it. So definitely really looking for what are these prices. If they go, if they go show through a gallery, what are they selling for at the gallery? There's a couple other things to consider within those that I'll go over later, but that's sort of the basics of that. So to get a ballpark figure, the sort of starting point, and you may have heard this before, is to one, figure out what your material cost is. Um, especially if you're doing 3D work, really pay attention throughout the process of what the cost of materials is going to be and add that to the time times your hourly rate. So how much are you going to pay yourself per hour that you worked on this? Are you going to pay yourself $20 an hour, $10 an hour, $15 an hour? That'll start to get you at least a ballpark figure of the generalized value of the work. But then you need to take that number and compare it to similar artists. Because if you get $600 from what you made, but other people are selling the same similar work for only $200, then no one's going to pay $600 for their, your work. Um, so you're going to want to start lower and then adjust up from there. You don't want to go high and then backtrack later. That's going to end up looking weird on your sales record. So it's better to start low. And if you suddenly see like, oh, I've sold out of everything in six months, then it's time to bring your price higher than that. Um, so definitely aim low, move up from there. Um, and those similar artists are going to be really the key to figuring it out. And maybe you're going to price it out and you're going to be like, well, I was only going to charge $50 for this, but I can see other people are getting $200 for it. That might be a good reason to price up. And once more, figuring out how you level up against those other artists um, as well. So some other things that you're going to want to consider in this pricing. One is your selling history. This is going to be a really great way to justify your prices later on. If you're tracking how much you're selling work for, then you have a history of it. So if someone goes, really, $300 for this? You can be like, yeah, these five people paid $300 for very similar works for that. So you'll be able to show, like, well, other people have paid this amount for it. So, yes, it's worth this amount, um, especially in a world where oftentimes art people are like, really, you're charging me for something that, you, like, is for this drawing this much? This is a really great choice to see people are willing to pay for it. This is how much it's worth. Um, actual sell price. So if you had an asking price that was high, but it actually sold for, like, 50 to 200 to $300 less than that, that's what the work actually sells for. That's probably closer to the ballpark of what price you're going to want to end up doing. Customer perspective. That's also going to be really important. So customers are always going to be looking for a deal. If you're at a show and you're sh showing your work, can they get three smaller pieces from somebody else for the same amount? Are they trying to get the most? It's always just good to know who your market is, what they're looking for, and be aware of that. That doesn't mean, okay, well, I should be making three smaller pieces and getting it that way. Don't adjust your work for that market. But knowing then, are you going to be selling next to someone who has three smaller pieces that are going to be the best for? Maybe you didn't sell something at that. It's good to know who the other people out there selling were. Um, and if you're able to give maybe some deals, it's like, okay, well, if this person will give you a deal for is three smaller pieces is the same as one of mine, maybe you can do two of mine for the price of one and a half or something like that. So kind of considering what that might look like and also what your aims of selling is going to be. And then being consistent. You don't want to jump around your prices all the time. Once you decide on a price, stick to that until your demand starts to increase. So once more, if you've sold out of all of your inventory within a couple of months, that's the chance to go higher. If you go to a show and you sell out of everything that you brought with you, that's a time to go higher. But it shouldn't be like, eh, well, I sold a couple of things, time to go higher every couple of months that you're doing this. Um, the other big thing is just because you really like a piece doesn't mean it's worth more money. Just because you have an emotional attachment to it doesn't automatically make it worth $100 more. It still should fall within that same range. You start to lose credibility if you have prices that are suddenly out of your normal range without there being a good justification of it. If this one's suddenly $200 higher because you used gold leaf on it, yep, that makes sense. But if it can't be $200 higher just because you like it more. If you don't want to sell the work, 
then don't have it as for sale anywhere. Um, make sure that it's really clear that this specific one is not for sale if you don't want to actively sell it rather than pricing it higher as a way of trying to dissuade other people from wanting to buy it. So for your pricing you're looking, when you're looking especially at similar artists, it's good for you to consider who are they actually selling to? Are they just selling to their friends and family? So if you talk to one of your classmates and you're like, oh, I heard you sold some pieces, ask them who they're selling it to. If it's friends and family, they're most likely going to pay more than just the average person that sees the work or off the street because they love you. They want to support you. They're happy to do that. So you might say $200, but it might actually be like 150 is what it would actually sell for if it wasn't your parents or your cousin or your best friend from high school. Um, some Anything that's sold through a charity event is usually going to go for more money because people are selling, are trying to give more money to the charity itself. Um, artists are going to pay less overall for artwork. Um, it's just kind of uh, once more the trend that we see. But what can be a really great thing is with your friends, if they have work that you like, trade with them. That will give you a chance to start to build up a collection and you'll build up a collector base as well. So trade piece for piece with your friends, with other people like that. Because then that starts to get your work out there a little bit more. If they go to your friend's house and they're like, oh, that's really cool, then, oh yeah, this is the artist that I that painted that. Um, and then other things like the wealthy demographics are going to pay more. So this is once more figuring out what is the expectation of the community that you're selling to? If you're selling once more to wealthy people who are used to paying more for things, then yeah, it might jump up a little bit more. If you're selling to college students who don't necessarily have a lot of disposable income, then it's going to jump down a little bit more. So really figuring out those demographics is going to be important for who's going to buy the actual work. So then this idea of gallery versus artists. So I talked about this at the beginning, how the student union is going to be selling. So the student union isn't going to take a commission. So you would price that as though it was coming directly from you. Um, in the case of other galleries, though, often they will take a commission on the work that you're doing. So you would end up pricing a little bit higher for that in order to cover a little bit of that commission cost. So that's also known as retail versus wholesale. If you have a studio visit and someone comes to you, then that's directly from you. That's going to be cheaper than if they bought it through the artist or through the gallery. The next thing is, is it an addition? From there, is it a limited addition? So if it's a limited edition, you can charge more than an unlimited edition. So if you have something that's a print, for example, that you're doing, um, number them all, sign them, and you can make up to, and you can't don't make more of them because that then undervalues the work. So if you say, cool, I'm making 10 of these, you make 10 of them, that's what it is. Um, you can make up to 10% of whatever your active amount is as artist prints, so you can use those for later Visions, you can use them to donate or you can sell them and those can sell for a higher rate, but that's kind of part of that initial um, print that you do. And how you figure out the pricing on that is you do that same thing of time material, adjust it based off of all the other factors, but then you divide it between the addition amount that you make. So if it's usually $100, if the price you figure out is $100 and there's 10 prints, then they're $10 each for the prints. If it's an unlimited edition, it's going to be even less than that. So in that case, maybe you would do like, okay, it's $5 each for the print because you can keep selling that print for basically as long as you want to because you have decided it's unlimited, so you can continue to print it basically forever. Um, so then the original versus the print. Um, if you have an original and you make prints of it, that's going to devalue the original, but often you can make more monies, money about it in the long run. So that's if you make something and then maybe you sell digital copies of it or prints that way. If you're going to sell something that way, the cost of the original will go down a little bit, but you, as I said, get to have the print to sell for basically ever um, within that. Oh. So can your fans afford your big pieces? That's always going to be a really important thing to consider. Can the people who really want to buy the things that you have get hold of them? Um, within this, maybe it's a good consideration of can you make smaller pieces that are more like one-off quicker things that you can do that you can charge less money for because maybe it took less time, it took less materials in order to allow these fans to start to build up a collection because then that's someone when they come into some money later that will seek you out and look for that. Um, or can you do prints of your original works? That would be the other question of that. Once more considering it does devalue the original work itself, but then you have the prints to sell basically for 
the whole time. And if someone wants to buy the original, you can charge more for that original piece. Uh, if you're going to do a group show, be really aware of the prices of the other people within that group that you're going with. You don't want to be the person in there that's charging the most for your work because you're most likely then going to sell less. Um, but the other thing with that is you also, if you're not the most well-known artist in that show, you don't want to be selling the most because that doesn't end up making active sense. Be ready to talk about also, oops, sorry, separate your for sale and your sold pieces online. So oftentimes if you have an online website where you're like, well, here's my pieces and then you have a like sold out over some of them, rather than that making your work look desirable and like lots of people are buying it, it ends up making people think that they've missed out on something and that they're just getting the leftover pieces that other people didn't want. So definitely making sure you can have your sold pieces still up on your website, still show them, but don't necessarily be like, oh, here's this one next to my for sale pieces. Um, I would have a separate section on the website for that. And then be ready to talk about what you've sold and how much you've sold it for. Once more, this is going to be your selling history. It's going to allow you to justify the prices that you have by being able to show, yep, other people have paid this much for it. And then also if you're talking to a gallery, if you're talking to a representative, whoever you're talking to, this is going to be important information for them to start to understand who your clientele is, what, who's looking at your work, how that all ends up looking. And then always consider why are you selling? Are you selling because you need to make money right now? Are you trying to create a collector base? Are you trying to unload inventory? Because some of those things may adjust prices a little bit. If you're trying to create more of a collector base, once more go a little bit lower because then more people are more likely to buy. And then as your prices go, they'll be more likely to follow you in the long run. If you need to make money, maybe you go for you don't go as low as you might go because you're like, cool, I really need to pay my rent this month. And so therefore, I need to make this much. It might be harder to take longer for it to sell, but it'll work that way. Or if you're unloading inventory, um, be aware when you're doing anything that's unloading inventory or if you're doing discounts, if you're just trying to make space in your storage, if you're going to do a discounted rate on stuff, you don't want to do that all the time because, as I said, people are going to be looking for deals. So if they're like, well, I know in six months I can get something I like in for half the price, then they're going to wait for it and not necessarily pay full price. So you definitely don't want to lower your prices all the time just in order to make space for it. Um, it's going to happen sometimes. It's totally okay to do, but be aware of how that's going to affect your seller base. Um, we often buy work from the Pratt Show for our office at the end of every year. And one big thing we always talk about within that is, well, if you were going to just throw it out at the end, then why shouldn't I just wait till you put it in the dumpster and then fish it out of the dumpster? We wouldn't do that, but it's kind of this idea of if they can get it for cheaper, if they can get it for free, why should they pay you for it early on if they can just fish it out of a dumpster later on? So keep the work that you have, and it's probably it's better to sell it for $20 and make something on it than to throw it out and have someone fishing it out of a dumpster later on. Um, so what are you going to need when you're showing your work? So these are the things you need to really develop. One is a price list. So whenever you're showing your work, whenever you even just have people in your studio, as you're creating work, I would create a price list. So this should include the title of the work, the medium, dimensions, if it's an addition, the number, of available ones and the price of the work. Don't make them have to come hunt you down and ask for the price. Once more, that's an extra step for them to have to do. It might dissuade them and it gives them the chance to look and then to your face, they don't need to go, oh, that's too expensive. Like it gives the buyer the power to really be able to make that decision um, about if this is the right work for them. Have an inventory of everything you have. So what you have, where it's currently located, so that can be if it's in a storage place somewhere, if it's at a gallery somewhere, if it's out for loan somewhere, how much you're asking for it. Do this for every piece you have and then do a history of where you've shown it and what the audience response for it is going to be as well. And if you do sell it, how much it actually sold for. Because that's once more just going to be that inventory list for you to be able to keep track of all the work that you have and where it goes. Um, also in the case of like insurance and if anything happens to your studio or where you're storing it, it's good to have that list of things and the value that and what it's valued at for the insurance purposes um, within that. 
and then have an invoice ready. So every time someone buys your work, you're going to want to send them an invoice. So on the invoice, you want to include what they're buying from you, how much it costs, if there were any discounts as part of it. So if you were giving it, it was if it was an inventory clean out, so it was 40% off, include actual price versus what you sold it for, because that then can help you keep track of the value. What are the terms of what you're going to do? Um, it can be good to add no refunds, re no returns on the bottom if you're not interested in having to deal with that. And then I would always consider a copyright section. So this lets them know, can they use this work on a t-shirt? You probably don't want them to just be able to go sell your work and put it on a t-shirt. So having that copyright section in that invoice is an agreement that they are making that they don't own the rights to do whatever they want to this piece or that they have to talk to you first. It could be like, this can be reproduced in other ways, but you have to get an okay from the artist or the artist might get a percentage of whatever profits come from that. Um, and then what's the future use that you could have of the work? Are you allowed to rent it from them or borrow it from them if you wanna put it in an exhibition? How are you, what are you allowed to do with the work? Is it okay, this is theirs now, it's theirs now, they can't reproduce it, but they won't let me necessarily take it back if I want to show it in a specific exhibition. They won't let me take it back for something like this. So having these types of things once more on the invoice, it acts as a contract. Um, the right of first refusal, if they decide that they're going to sell your artwork, do they have to offer it back to you first? Um, you would buy it back from them, but that's another thing you might want to consider having on the invoice is do they get the okay? Can they sell it to anybody now if they decide to? Or do you want them to have to come talk to you and you have the right to say, I want it before they are able to offer it to anybody else? And then both of you would sign it, therefore agreeing to the terms. You would want it, you would keep a copy, they would get a copy. That's a good way to just keep everything nice and so everyone knows what's going on because later down the road, if something comes up and you see it on a t shirt, that's something you can pull out and be like, hey, um, what's happening here? This is not what we agreed on. That's to keep you as the artist safe and it helps the buyer kind of understand the terms of everything that's going on with your work. And yeah, so that's basically my sort of overview of pricing the artwork. There's kind of a lot of factors to consider and most of it will be done through research. Um, but yeah, I'm open to questions that any of you have. Um, online, you can put it in the chat field and if you can just raise your hand.